Please pray with me. Spirit of life and love, minister to us, your people, we pray. May only truth be spoken, may only truth be heard, we ask. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you and good to see you. I've enjoyed three months of doing what I wanted and seeing lots of family and friends all over, catching up from COVID, you know. And uh, my brother was up for a week, so uh, just a lot of good times. I start back to work this uh, coming week full time in St. Thomas. The two downtown churches, First United Church and Central United Church, really like the Trinity Mount Zion model. And so uh, I'm working with, uh, there'll be three of us in the team. Uh, you know Austin, my, my daughter's boyfriend, he's going to be with us. And uh, maybe Janine, when she gets ordained uh, in June, we're in talks with her. So anyway, look forward to uh, enjoying getting to know the folks down there. As this is Worldwide Communion, I've been thinking about the power of communion. Not particularly this ritual of communion. The ritual of communion actually points us to the power of true communion. Because the power of communion is really the power of community. True, caring community. The dictionary defines communion as the sharing and exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. I love that. Intimate thoughts and feelings, especially in the context of the mental and spiritual level. You know, I've been talking over the years to you folks <laughs> about the more intimate we become, the more we're able to risk together and learn how to care for each other and sort out little conflicts without getting, you know, cut off the greater the power. It's like the more communion we have, the accelerator of God's spirit and the power of God is released proportionately. And we live at a time when communion is under attack in the general society around us and around the world. People are angry. People are fragile. As a society, we are becoming more, reflect, more reactive, more fearful. And anger, reactivity, and fear are the opposite of communion. They're the opposite of caring community. A writer about the internet by the name of Caitlin Tiffany shares a personal story in this month's edition of The Atlantic magazine. She writes, last spring my boyfriend sublet a spare room in his apartment to an aspiring model. The roommate was young and kind of made us feel old, but was always open for sharing a bottle of wine and he seemed to like us. One night he and my boyfriend started bickering about which Lord album was the better, the first one or the second one, Lord's a singer from New Zealand. They went on and on, repeating their arguments, getting louder all the time, and it was Friday night, and I was tired, and I snapped. This conversation is dumb, and I don't want to keep having it. I knew I was rude, but I thought it was kind of just the rude way families and friends can be sometimes, you know, when they're exasperated. So I was kind of shocked when the roommate got up without a word, went into his room, slammed the door, and never spoke to me again. He ignored me. Anytime I came to the apartment, he walked in his bedroom when I came to visit, and he played the song, Hey, Hey, You, I Don't Like Your Girlfriend, very loudly. <laughs> Eventually, my boyfriend texted him and asked him if he would talk about the situation, and he replied, There's no point, your girlfriend is toxic. This is the big word now in the social media. Toxic. Everybody's toxic. If you don't, oblig you don't agree with everything they say, they're toxic, right? Just cut off from them. That's what I'm talking about. Communion is under attack. People are losing the ability to disagree agreeably. 
So this is the latest word, to dismiss people wholesale without any attempt to dialogue, to listen to each other, and to know how to work things out. It's a sign of the times. I've got a dear friend, and uh, we've been buddies since school, and we've, you know, been close and just wonderful time, but I have a friend of a friend who is going to Newfoundland, I thought, you know, for a convention, and there were no cars, literally, that you could rent. So I phoned my buddy and said, look, you got an extra car, I got a friend of a friend here, she's, you know, responsible, how about loaning her your car just to get around, she'd even, you know, pay you some money for it. He said, no problem. But then it turns out she was planned on taking a three-week trip around Newfoundland after and assumed that his car was going to be good for that too. And they got into a fight, and the long and short of it is he won't speak to me now. Oh. Right? That's how fragile we are. He's ghosting me. Now I got hope. <laughs> I'll be working on solving that, but it's very sad. Because most people aren't toxic. But we seem to think, you know, it's all about individualism and, 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 and the cutting off. And that might feel good for a while, but it's not good. And cutting off from people and not having people to commune with and share with, that's what's toxic. That's more harmful to our spirit than smoking is to our body. You know, my brother, I said, was up, and honestly, when I was a little kid, eh, he was my hero. In some ways, I still look to him. That fella is relentlessly positive. Everywhere we traveled for a week, whether it was to get a bite to eat somewhere, or go to a movie theater, or wherever, he never lost a minute of making people feel good and, and talking to them in a way that lifted them up. I mean, the guy was just relentless, tossing fairy dust everywhere, right? Like, <laughs> blew my mind. But I thought, gosh, that's what we need more of. Just realizing the influence we have by just taking an extra moment to thank a waitress, say, or, or, or to say, oh my, you did a really good job uh, fixing that, right? Whatever it is, right? Every day we have a sphere of influence with the people around us. Of course, what society is into, and probably always has been, they love to celebrate achievement and doing remarkable things, and the social media is filled with clips of remarkable things, whether it's animals doing crazy things or people doing amazing things, right? That's, that's all the rage, accomplishments of different kind. And of course, what's the greatest symbol of accomplishment in our world today? Money, right? We worship money and... and uh, but the reality is, as the social scientists have found out, in which the people who wrote the Bible and many other uh, <laughs> religious um, writers over the years know, that uh, once our basic needs are taken care of, money and achievement has little ability to lead us to a place of inner peace, to a place of well-being. What we really long for is communion, and we get meaning from actually helping people and knowing we've made a difference because that's our divine nature. The Apostle Paul that knew 2,000 years ago when he wrote, if I speak brilliantly and hold people captive, I might make a couple million bucks, but <laughs> I'll really be no more than a noisy gong. If I'm a visionary and understand all mysteries, I might win a Nobel Prize. But if I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I am a multi-billionaire and give away most of my money to wonderful things, but I don't have love, I'm personally not going to gain anything. Love never ends. All our other gifts, they're going to come to an end, but faith, hope, and love are forever. And the greatest of these is love. Of course, agape love that Jesus taught isn't always easy. It's not always easy to care. It's not always easy to be respectful and People aggravate us. <laughs> Fairness is often the harder path sometimes. But these are the only pathways that lead to inner peace. And they're the only pathways that move our world forward in terms of more human rights, and more civilization and better treatment of one another. The power to change our lives in the world is not money. It is communion, authentic, caring community. 
Because when you have that, money and everything else that's needed somehow finds its way to that community. That's the magic of spirit. The sharing and exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings and a mental and spiritual level, and I would add expressing caring for one another, that's the power of real communion. I mean, this reminds us of a group of people who gave their lives for each other and for the world, who received and gave love at a deep level. And it calls us to join them. And amazing things. And, and you know, <laughs> Karl Barth was a famous theologian back in the day. And he said, you know, when I first heard this, I didn't get it. He said, I read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And what he was saying is, if we can't see in the news today what the Bible's talking about, the Bible's irrelevant to us. So let me give you a news story that's up to date, that's a miracle. It's an amazing miracle. And it shows the power of communion. Most of us have heard the news story a few weeks ago about Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, and Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas. They are both Trump wannabes, and their policies are particularly cruel and irrational. They, dress, they dreamed up a stunt, which was illegal too, to embarrass Biden and the Democratic state of Massachusetts in their support of immigration. They took 50 undocumented migrants from Texas from a holding cell. They took them by force. They lied to them and told them that they were sending them to housing in another state. They rented a private plane and sent these 50 migrants of men, women, and children to Martha's Vineyard, an island off the coast of Massachusetts known for wealthy cottages. Any of you catch this story? The refugees could not speak English. They didn't know where they were going, and no plans existed for them for what would happen when they got there. These men, women, and children were simply dropped off at a little airport in Martha's Vineyard with no plans, just abandoned. Isn't that amazing? The plan was to create confusion and crisis to embarrass the Biden administration, make Massachusetts a laughing stock and say, oh, you see, it's not easy taking care of refugees, is it? All at the expense of vulnerable people whose only crime was to be poor. But you know what? We haven't heard much about it since, did we? Didn't create that crisis. And here's why. Someone at the airport said, well, <laughs> uh, go to the Island Community Services Building a service organization that the Reverend Vincent Chip Seasdale and his congregation helped to found. Janet, the counselor at ICS, was just ending her day when these 50 migrant people showed up at the door. She immediately called Reverend Chip and said, what can we do? Chip began making calls to church members and other local organizations. For years, he had organized inter-church luncheons for church leaders so they could build trust in the community and build communion, working together with local needs. This experience of communion gave the group a sense of trust and shared mission that made collaboration easy and saved the day. As word spread, volunteers began showing up. For many years, the church, this church, helped run an overnight winter shelter program on the island. During that time, they trained 150 to 200 people in how to provide services to vulnerable people in need. Isn't that amazing? So when people learned of these migrants needing help, they knew what to do. The food ministry leader showed up with food. The shelter volunteer showed up with cots. The translator showed up. Lawyers showed up to offer services. Doctors, dentists, police, and firework, they all showed up within three hours. Reverend Chip recognized that his church was uniquely able to handle this situation because they had already invested in working collaboratively together with other organizations and congregations on the island. They had developed their skills of communion and had trust within their community. So when the crisis hit, 
That history of trust and community, their experience of communion meant that all the migrants were settled and cared for within three hours of Reverend Chip getting the call. That's why you never heard anything imported since. So when this crisis hit, they were able to do it. It was an amazing thing, Chip said. We were just taking care of people. As a church, that's what we do. I have spent a few days crying tears of joy. We simply said, yes, our call as Christians is to take care of the stranger. Caring for one another, partnering with others, being allies, that's what keeps the church alive. And that's what's keeping this church alive. I mean, I was just so thrilled with seeing this church come together for the Courtney family. I mean, part of the problem, you know, there's so many people now, like the funeral directors, they say, there's so many people who, who are dying and they aren't even having, families aren't even having their own memorial services. It's just nothing. And so to be a part of a community and, and uh, bring in a caterer and have the whole thing and just, just at people's time and need to be there for one another. That's what communion is. And that's what we can be for everybody who finds this place. The values of this church here have never been needed more in the history of this church. This church is needed more today than when you were booming 50 years ago or so. And contrary to all social trends, your greatest days can be ahead of you if you invest in this practice of communion. Because God needs you, and you need one another. So, let's enjoy a song calling us to this table of communion, calling us to this table of love and acceptance and encouragement. As Heather sings for us, loving God. 